but it was a good start. Very soon, assuming Hazak and Wantra didn't find anything suspicious, they could really start considering this zone to be safe. Computer, Hagan called to attract the attention of the base AI. Reason, came a disembodied voice from speakers scattered around the room. My name is Reason, Admiral Hagan. How can I be of assistance to you? Well, firstly, Hagan said, you can tell me what this contamination is. I'm sorry, Admiral, Reason said, but like much of our work here, that information is classified. The subroutine of my personality assigned to help and support you does not have access to any further details about the contamination. Okay, thanks anyway, Reason, Hagon said, pensively. Then, can you get me a line out of here? I want to make some calls. Of course, Reason said. Our communication suite is at your service. You may access it from your desk. Hagon called up a dialer and, before he even knew what he was doing, he found he was halfway through punching in an old, familiar contact request. There was a tone as his call was put through. A full-size hologram appeared in the room with him, standing beside his desk. The creature was humanoid, but not human. The face of the being in the hologram didn't have as many muscles in it as a human face. It was expressive, though, but it was different. Admiral, the hologram said its tone of voice giving no clue whether Hagan's call was welcome or not. Brax, Hagan said in reply, the frosty relationship between the two obvious now, with most of the hostility coming from Hagan. What do you want? Brax asked. Is Altia there? Hagan responded. The android sighed and looked down for a moment before he replied. You know she isn't, don't you, Admiral? Has she left any message with you? What kind of message? Brax asked. And how would she reach me? I don't know, Hagon growled. A thought, perhaps? I assume you have heard the reports of where Altia is believed to be now, and what she is believed to be doing, the android said, quite gently. Altia has not joined the rebellion, Hagon snorted. She's a scientist, not a warrior. I don't know how the Emperor's propagandists latched onto that idea, but it's crazy. Altia will make contact sooner or later, and we will have to help her out of whatever mess she's gotten dragged into. I promise you, Admiral, Brax said. As I told you last time you called, if I hear anything, you will be the first to know. Thank you, Hagan said. I'm sorry if I've taken up too much of your time. Don't mention it, Brax said, and the hologram faded, leaving Hagan alone, staring out over the rocky expanse of the asteroid just outside his window. Two days later, Hagon's store of patience was rapidly coming to an end. The accommodation block, which Hagon and the two marines seemed to have entirely to themselves, was starting to feel like a prison. It had a decent conference room, discovered by the marines on their first sweep. Hagon set up an operations room there, with numerous tactical holograms and screens. He had spent most of the two days there, getting his head round the situation he now found himself in and the two marines regularly came to the room and reported when they were now patrolling the corridors. Both were in the control room with Hagon at that moment. Hazak, Wantra, Hagon said, I am more convinced than ever that something is seriously wrong here. I second that, Admiral, Hazak said, while Wantra just nodded. All three of us know how insidious the Z-forms can be. It was us that discovered the bronze artifact that produces them. I haven't forgotten that you were both at the spearhead of the action where it was retrieved. Both marines nodded without interrupting. This is what you saw on board the Cutlass and down on the planet it was orbiting make you think that the Z-forms are capable of infecting a base the size of Seed of Reason? It can't be discounted, Admiral, Wantra said, in my opinion. I agree, Hagon said, and if this base is compromised... Could the z form somehow fake messages from Shivy and the base commander? Could it actually be z forms telling us to sit tight in here and do nothing? We didn't see any evidence to suggest that was possible, Hazak said, her words measured. The z forms at no point attempted to communicate with us, at least as far as we are aware. True, Hagon nodded. But they did dismantle and cannibalize components of the Cutlass, mostly around the bridge, where we found the artifact. Undoubtedly, Wantra said. 
which means they likely possess beyond animal intelligence, Hagon continued. Definitely, Wantra agreed. Hagon nodded, then fell silent. What he was considering was audacious, and, if he was wrong, it would take him some time to live it down. I think we have to know, Hagon said. We are going to recon the area of this base that we have been told is off-limits because of an incident of contamination. Both Marines nodded. And let's be clear, Hagon added. What I expect to find is that this base has been overrun by Z-forms. That means things could get real crazy, real fast. In our previous encounters, it was only when we attempted to penetrate within the base structure that the Z-forms began to defend themselves. While on the Cutlass, Hazak said, the contamination seemed to have run its course. The spaceship was empty, and we were presented with no resistance as we penetrated into the structure. We did not encounter a single live Z-form, though I believe we did see their remains. Absolutely, Hagan nodded. The recon will be done in a very unpredictable environment. We could encounter a hive, crawling with monstrous aliens, a ruin with only damage, vandalism, modifications and secretions, to show the aliens were ever there, a team of dedicated and loyal Terrazid scientists bravely dealing with some form of contamination as they told us, or some other scenario we haven't encountered yet. Based on our equipment, I'd like a recommendation on how to proceed. It was Hazak who responded to Hagon's request, but he had no doubt both had been involved in formulating the plan she suggested. He saw Wantra nodding as Hazak talked, and glancing at him to gauge his reaction. We do not have any drones on the shuttle, Hazak said, so I recommend that I simply enter the off-limits area and take a quick look around. We will need to create an airlock to isolate the access point we select. When I open the door to the off-limits section, the area I access it from will then be protected from the contamination by the airlock we create. At least in theory. Base Commander Protar has not provided any details of the contamination, so it is not possible to definitively say that a makeshift airlock will be an effective barrier. Hagan nodded and has it continued. Communications have been a problem in the past, so I will drop a line-of-sight laser communicator beacon at each intersection I pass to ensure useful intel is gathered whatever happens to me. The recon should be brief and limited in scope. We propose, has it glanced at Wantra at this point, who nodded encouragement, that the recon mission should have a half-hour duration and be limited to one single structure, one of the secure labs or one of the admin buildings, for example. Hagan nodded. It's a good plan. How long before we can start? We have an insertion point selected, Wantra said, calling up a map in a tactical hologram. Here, opening this door to allow us to scout this single secure lab complex will mean creating a makeshift airlock here, behind the scout, to ensure our safe zone remains safe. We could have an airlock in position in under an hour and be ready to go just a short time after that. Excellent, Hagan nodded. That lab looks as good a place as any to start. I'll stay here in the control room we've set up. Hazak, you will be the scout, and Wantra, you will wait on the safe side of the airlock. You'll be best placed there to react to whatever Hazak encounters. We'll make a determination at the end of the mission about whether it is possible to readmit you to the safe hour, Hazak. Hazak simply nodded, understanding that this was by no means a foregone conclusion. All three of them were silent for a moment, and Wantra's eyes were slowly drawn to one of the room's windows. The eyes of the other two followed her glance, and all three ended up staring out of the window at a vista of the asteroid surface, including the secure lab they had selected for reconnaissance. Hanging above the lab for a moment, as it lazily orbited the asteroid, was the Cutlass. It cast a shadow over the surface of the asteroid that slowly approached the secure lab building, and then traveled over it plunging the building into darkness. There were lights to be seen, through small transparent armor windows, and they shone more intensely as the shadow of the spaceship above engulfed the structure. If I encounter one of the Z-forms, Hazak said, breaking the silence, what are my orders? The last time you went toe-to-toe -to -toe with Z-forms, back at Research Base Lockin, you were wearing full combat armor and were supported by a pack of drones, and the Z-forms still chewed you both up. Hagan said pensively, I still on the Cutlass, the wreck they had found in orbit round the planet, 
before they had descended to research base Lotkin on the surface, and that had been brought to Seat of Reason on Shivia's orders. I don't know if you will be able to prevail against even a single Z-form equipped with only a slim suit and a blaster rifle. Both Marines nodded. His assessment was indisputable. So, Hagan continued, My orders, if you meet a Z-form crawling around in those corridors, are to retreat. Just get out of there as fast as you can. Hazak and Wantra were both now at the insertion point, a small set of double doors at the end of a corridor. The airlock, gaping open, was just a few yards down the corridor behind them. Both had their helmets on and their blaster rifles drawn. I can't open this, Hazak indicated the secure lab door with her thumb, until you go through our new airlock and close the door behind you, okay? Okay, Wantra said, and placed her hand on Hazak's armored shoulder in a gesture of encouragement. The armor felt horribly thin under Wantra's fingers. Slim suits were extremely advanced, and they packed a lot of protection into a very small size, but they just didn't have the same bulk as a good suit of three meter tall, or more sometimes, powered combat armor, of the type they were usually equipped with on most missions. They usually had upwards of four drones willing to fling themselves between their human operators and incoming fire as well. Going into the complex wearing just a slim suit and armed with just a single blaster rifle, without a protective screen of mindless drones to blunt any enemy attack, felt horribly primitive. Hazak's face, what was visible of it through the slim suit helmet at least, was resolute, however, and Hazak left her there at the insertion point without another word. She went into the open airlock, cycled through it, and turned to look at Hazak through the small airlock viewport. Hazak gave her a thumbs up and turned her attention to the secure lab door. Hazak was alone now, with just her rifle, her armor, and the stuff in a large bag carried over her shoulder. There were explosive charges already fixed to the door, shaped so that all the energy was directed away from Hazak. She pushed a button and took a step back and, three seconds later, she felt a wump of concussive force transmitted through the floor and smoke started billowing from the edges of the doors. There was a hydraulic jack already in position at the crack where the doors met. Now that crack was gaping open a fraction and the jack forced its jaws in and then started to widen. A gap appeared between the doors, just a couple of inches at first, but then the jack kept working, widening the gap in a scream of tortured metal. Hazak stepped over the jack and slipped through the gap as soon as she thought it was wide enough, and she was in the off-limit section of the base, smoke still billowing round her. Corridor looks normal, she said. No crazy alien graffiti or accretions of alien goo stuck to the wall. The lights are on in here, but I don't see anyone around. Great, Hagan said from the control room. I'm getting perfect pictures from your helmet and gun cameras, and nice sensor readings. Don't forget to drop those laser communications, though. We don't know how long we're going to have such clear reception. No problem, Hazak said pulling a communicator blister out of her pack and holding it against the wall. The communications blister stuck there and switched on. Moving on, Hazak said. I'm taking the most direct route to the main lab. Any sign of contamination or contamination countermeasures, Wantra asked. Difficult to say without more information about what sort of lurgy is supposed to be loose in here, Hazak answered. But nothing so far. Hagan watched the pictures as Hazak continued along the route to the main lab attaching comms blisters to the walls as she went. Everything looked quite normal. No deviations from the plans they had been given, and no contacts with alien monsters. Hagan started to get a sick feeling in his gut that he had miscalculated, that everything was normal within the base, as normal as anything ever was where Shivia and her eggheads were concerned, and this little incursion would be punished. Got something here, Hazak said. This looks like the accretions left by the Z-forms to me. Hagan's attention, which had wandered to scenes of court-martial and ruin, were riveted on the screens again. The best view was from the gun camera in Hazak's blaster rifle, which she was obviously pointing at what she found, while trying to keep her body as far away as possible. It was hard for Hagan to tell what he was looking at on a two-dimensional screen, so he also sent the gun camera's feed, along with the helmet feed, 
to a tactical hologram which created a three-dimensional image. Looks alien, Hagon agreed. Like it was secreted by an insect, perhaps. Definitely squirted out of a Z-form's butt, Hazak said, making Hagon smile. And I can see bits of technology mixed in among the organic mess. Okay, Hagon said, voice authoritative. That'll do for scientific analysis for now. Time to keep moving. Received, came Hazak's voice over the comms channel, but some static and interference was starting to creep into the signal. Z-forms, Hagon whispered. So softly it wouldn't be picked up by the mic at his suit's collar. I'm getting interference, Wantra's voice came over the comms channel. Like happens when there are Z-forms about. Confirmed, Hagon said. Loud enough to be transmitted this time. Remember to drop those comp blisters, Hazak. Okay, came her reply. I see somebody at the end of the corridor. Unarmed. Not trying to hide or take cover. Looks human. I see them too, Hagon told her. Go over and say hello. Approaching contact, Hazak said. Hagon watched in the feed from the helmet cam, and he noticed how the interference got progressively worse the closer Hazak came to the contact. Despite that, Hagon could still see that the contact looked human and seemed to be dressed in the sort of combination of overalls and utility belts you might expect to find a scientist wearing in a secure lab. The scientist was female, average height and build. I don't see any protective gear, Wantra's voice coming over the comms pointed out. More evidence that this contamination is a phony cover story. I have half a mind to come through this airlock and do some exploring with you. Hold position, Wantra, Hagan said. You there, Hazak yelled at the scientist. I have some questions for you. The scientist was walking at a steady pace in the direction of Hazak, even before the Marine yelled out her challenge, and she didn't slow down, speed up, or say a word in response. Okay, this is odd, Hazak said. She has to see I have a blaster rifle. That's close enough, Hagan said. Stop her there. Halt, Hazak shouted, but the scientist continued approaching. Permission to fire, Hazak asked. Challenge her again, Hagan said, on my authority. Halt, Hazak yelled at the steadily approaching scientist, by order of Admiral Hagan. Again, there was no change in the approaching scientist's behavior. She hadn't even slowed her leisurely pace. Okay, you can shoot her, Hagan said. But just wing her. The shot came almost immediately after Hagan's order. It tore a hole in the woman's shoulder and sent her spinning away down the corridor a couple of paces. The woman slumped against the wall and slid to the floor where she sat unmoving. Nice shooting, Hazak, Hagan said. Now go over, nice and slow, and see if the contact is still alive. Hagan watched as the scientist slumped against the wall, loomed larger and larger in the image he was getting from Hazak. He saw the damage her blaster shot had done, the charring to the scientist's overalls, and the characteristic chunk of flesh that had superheated and exploded outwards, tearing blood vessels open and shattering bone. The scientist's shoulder was now a bloody mess, but Hagon's gaze didn't linger there long. He was a military man, and had seen similar wounds many times before. Instead, his attention was drawn to the head of the woman slumped against the wall. He saw that there was something wrong with it, but it was hard to make sense of exactly what, on a two-dimensional screen through a helmet camera with static and lost data packets distorting the image. What's wrong with her head? He heard Wantra voicing the question on his mind. It looks like she's been scalped, Hazak replied. Or maybe lobotomized. Whatever happened to her, it was a big job. I hope they used anesthetic. Hagan often found the gallows humor of the warriors fighting for him entertaining, but not this time. He was slowly beginning to understand what he was looking at, and it was far too unsettling for jokes. You can come on back, Hazak, he said. I think I've seen all I need to for now. Do I stay on this side of the airlock? Hazak asked. Her camera feed already showing that she was moving rapidly back to the safe area. Come right on through. I think the cover story about contamination is true enough, but I don't think it's any danger to us. Unless Shivya gets the urge to do some surgery on us. Chapter 4 the Myronie shifted slightly as its grav engines transitioned from station keeping to thrust. The slight movement was enough to attract the attention of the inhabitants of Yedop. 
It was midday on the swamp world, and the light penetrating through the soupy atmosphere was a bilious shade of green. The Myronese was so large it cast a shadow over almost an entire quarter of the city below, creating a deeper shadow of a darker, more impenetrable shade of green. The city was a collection of concrete boxes, with enough mangrove trees thrown between them to support the local ecosystem, even within the city itself. This wasn't a city of paved roads. It was a city of muddy canals, gnarled tree roots, and rotten, crumbling, substandard concrete, shot through with confused knots of plumbing, power, and data cables. The inhabitants of the city watched as the Myronese climbed, dwindling, but becoming lost in the cloud banks above them, long before becoming too small to see. Alti and Nave were watching through the transparent armor at the front of the bridge as the planet fell away beneath them as they climbed back into orbit, a lot more slowly than the frigate had fallen through the atmosphere on the way down. A hologram slowly formed behind them, Jay, metal arms hanging at its sides, his robot face impassive. I've contacted the captain of that system defense barge, he said. She's keen to get her hands on the three frigates we took out, and use them as the beginnings of a rebel navy squadron. When you two arrive in orbit, there will already be a rebel transport, ready to rendezvous and take over command of the Myronese. Okay, Nave said, hardly paying attention. His eyes were on the woman he shared the bridge with. Nave was leaning against the edge of the transparent armor at the front of the bridge, and Algia was standing at the center, staring out at the thinning atmosphere and the oncoming stars. Almost as though she could feel his eyes on her, she turned her head to look at him and smiled. Jay saw the gesture, and he saw how Nave reacted to it. His head turned slowly. First he looked at Altia, then Nave, then back at Altia. What's going on with you two? he asked. We're in love, Nave said. Altia nodded, the smile on her face seemingly stuck there. Well, obviously, Jay said. I knew you two would get together. I've known it all along. I didn't know it would take this amount of time to admit it to each other, though. Neither Nave nor Altia acknowledged what the robot had said. Their eyes were still locked on each other. They were both smiling. You picked a funny time to tell each other you were in love, Jay said. I mean, what with the rebellion and everything? Again, the robot didn't get a reply. Well, okay, Jay said. I've got some important stuff to do over here, so I'll see you two back on Galaxy Dog, after you've handed over this frigate to the local resistance. Still no response. So, your ship has all the details. Jay out, the hologram said, and it flickered and faded, leaving Nave and Altia alone again, apart from the sedated Imperial captain. Altia came over to Nave and leaned against him. They kissed, and Altia rested her head against his shoulder, and they both gazed out the viewing port at the receding planet. Myra, Nave said. Have you got a fix on that transport Jay was talking about? Yes, Myra said, though it is not a configuration that would be designated a transport in the Terrazit Imperial Deep Space Navy. It's a garbage scow. You're not in the Imperial Navy anymore, Nave told Myra. Confirmed, the computer said. How long before we dock with that transport? We have to clear the atmosphere, and near orbit is now so full of debris that maneuvering will be tricky. It will be about half an hour. Thank you, Myra, Nave said then turned his attention back to Altia. He saw that she was smiling at him. The view out the bridge viewing port was breathtaking, and the surface of the planet faded, but neither had eyes for it. They only had eyes for each other. They kissed again, and they giggled conspiratorially at the sudden change in their relationship. This isn't exactly how I wanted to do this, Altia said. I was waiting for some more romantic moment. Some moment of calm between all the action, but the right moment just never came. I felt like I was going to burst, and well, I just couldn't wait a second longer to tell you how I feel. Nave glanced around the cold, dark, sinister bridge. It was utilitarian and military in design, with not a hint of decoration. Everything was in the regulation colors of the Terrazid Navy, all grays, blacks, and dark hues. There were cables hanging out of the access port where Altia had hacked the ship's computer, and there was a body slumped on the floor. Nonsense, Nave said. It's the most romantic spot in the galaxy right now. 
They both watch the garbage scow arrive, approach on a set vector, and dock with the Myronese. Then there was a pause of a few minutes, while the rebels found their way to the bridge. Then the bridge door slid up, and three rebels came hesitantly into the room. There were two men and a woman, all dressed in simple brown vacuum suits, with a very thin-looking armor vest thrown over. My name's Geem, the woman said. I'm the space captain for this local uprising. You must be Naven Altia. Your robot friend has been telling me all about you. Great to meet you, Captain, Altia said. We can't stay around, Nave said. Our contribution to the rebellion counts most if we keep moving. I don't doubt it, Gein said. You turned defeat into victory here today. I'm sure that's the sort of intervention that's needed in a lot of places right now. A lot of places, Altia nodded. This rebellion is spreading. The Corruptorazid Star Empire is fertile ground for a revolt. A lot of people want to create new Terrazid. The thing is, Gein said, I'm not sure whether I want to thank you or not. What? Nave said, voicing Altia in his sudden confusion. You see, Gein continued, before you got here, everyone pretty much understood what we were doing was a suicide mission. But now, with three frigates, even if they need a few repairs, we might actually have a chance. I had kind of prepared myself for a grand suicidal gesture of defiance, not the hard slog of resistance. I never imagined we had a chance to actually take this system from Terrazid, but now, who knows? You're welcome, Captain Gein, Altia said, and good luck. The drifter ship was traveling faster than light, which did crazy things to the stars they could see through the ship's windows. Altia's suite of rooms had a huge, hexagonal area of transparent armor in the bedroom, a kind of window, and with stars streaking by, it was unavoidably the center of attention. In front of this window was a huge circular bed. Altia was lying in the bed, gazing at Nave, silhouetted against the huge view. Your room is amazing, Nave said. My windows are tiny in comparison. If I want to look at space, I usually go to the observation deck. The architecture of the ship is malleable, you know, Altia said. You can shape it to suit your needs. To a certain extent, at least. I knew that. But it never occurred to me to do something on such a grand scale. I got the idea from watching you on the observation deck, Altia said. At first it annoyed me, seeing you just sitting there, not doing anything useful, for hours at a time. But later... You came round to the idea, Nave smiled. I did and I put this window here so I could gaze at the stars, meditate, empty my mind, the way you do, but... But? But there's just too much to do. I don't have time, what was studying this spaceship, carrying on my work on decryption of the various drifter languages, and now I've become a warrior in a rebellion that is taking root across the entire Terrazid Star Empire. Doesn't leave much time for stargazing. Or for falling in love, Nave teased. I guess that happens whether you make time for it or not, Altia said. I find you alluring and fascinating in a way I never have with anyone else before. Right back at you, babe, Nave said, with a wink. Although the power is only no why, she said with a groan. Okay, like I said, I've got a lot of work to do. Out. Out, Nave repeated, a little crestfallen. Don't worry, Altia purred at him. We'll pick this up later, but for now out. Nave smiled and nodded, and started gathering and putting on his clothes. I guess Jay will get lonely if we spend the whole day in here, he said, and we'll be getting our next call for help pretty soon. About that, Altia said, making him pause on his way to the door. I don't like this role we've ended up in, as roving troubleshooters. I don't think it's the right way, not in the long term. What do you mean? Nave asked. Half of the things gathered in his arms falling back to the floor. He waited expectantly for an answer, but one didn't come. Instead of answering him, Altia just hopped out of bed and started collecting her things as well. Can you go find Jay? she said distractedly. Sure, Nave said. I'm not sure what our next move should be, Altia said. But I don't think we should just go tearing off to help the next people to ask us. I'd like to hear Jay's ideas for our next move. Nave didn't need to go wandering around to find Jay. All he had to do was reach out with his mind. There was a flow of information, 
everywhere within the drifter ship, a flow that could be accessed by the mind without any physical interface at all. It was just another example of how drifter technology was so much more advanced than human technology that it verged on magic. Nave reached out with his mind, merging some part of his consciousness with the stream of data, and he queried it about Jay's whereabouts. The data stream indicated to him where Jay was, and Nave started walking. He walked through corridor after corridor of the ship, each one with a hexagonal cross-section. The doors were hexagonal too, as were the screens showing information, and even the windows giving a view on space that he very occasionally passed. At last, Nave came to a particularly large hexagonal door, and it slid out of the way to allow him through. The space on the other side was the largest of their docking bays, a cavernous space, easily big enough to accommodate four or five shuttles. They had two, both obviously of a different design and manufactured to the rest of the ship. The shuttles were created by humans, not drifters, and so they looked mechanical rather than architectural. They were based on quadratic shapes and circles, while the bay around them was alien, and based much more on hexagonal shapes. The docking bay was dimly lit, Nave thought, as was much of the drifter ship. He caught himself thinking of their super-advanced alien spaceship as the drifter ship, and hastily corrected himself. It wasn't the drifter ship. For him at least, it would always be called Galaxy Dog. Nave couldn't see Jay right away, and although he could have dipped back into the stream of information, he chose to just yell out Jay's name. Over here, Jay called, and Nave spotted him then, in a corner of the huge space. The tall robot was squatting down on the floor, working on a machine that looked like a cross between a crab and a cockroach, all splayed out and squished. What have you got there? Nave asked. Just a project, Jay answered, his sensor eyes glowing a dim red in the gloom, his alien robot body's voice box lightly mangling the words. More of a hobby, really. I found the plans for these in the data stream. I wondered if I would be able to build one. It's quite delicate work. Are you making it so it has artificial intelligence? Nave asked. Like your creator did for you? No, Jay said. And I can't prove I have artificial intelligence. I don't have all the paperwork to show I'm full AI. For what it's worth, Nave said, you seem pretty smart to me. Thanks, Nave, for what it's worth, Jay said. Anyway, once I've got it going, I'll task it with keeping this two shuttles spaceworthy. They'll soon turn into large piles of scrap if we don't look after them. Don't they have auto repair, like Galaxy Dog? Nave asked, patting the wall of the docking bay proudly. No, Jay said. There are about a thousand checks that need doing on them every day. It's robot work. Aren't you ask me to come fetch you, Nave said. She's had a big idea and she wants her input. It's interesting that you two have gotten together now, Jay said. It sure is, Nave said a smile spreading across his face. But you predicted it right from the start. You said me and her were destined to be together. I just didn't believe you. No, Jay said, his spidery metal fingers putting down the tools he was using on the squished-looking little robot. I mean the timing. It's interesting that it has happened now. Where are you getting at, Jay? Nave asked, his smile fading, but not disappearing entirely. I have seen the two of you becoming gradually closer. You a lot faster than her. Nave nodded, listening to what Jay had to say without taking offense. But I thought it was going to be another good few months before one of you actually summoned the courage to make a move. By the way, on the Myronese, who came on who? Whom, Nave corrected him. Whom came on the who? Stop dodging the question, Nave. I know you don't give a frigid ball of space turd about grammar. And you have that the wrong way round. She... Sort of. Started the ball rolling, Nave admitted. Did you know she got a message a couple of days ago? Jay asked. I did not, Nave said. How would that happen? Who even knows how to contact us here? And how do you know, anyway? It was put out over a public service, encrypted and ciphered, but public. Anyone who cares to look would be able to see it. And you think this message has something to do with her making the moves on me? Nave said. Maybe, Jay said, his scattering of glowing red eyes latched onto Nave. It was from Admiral Hagon. Her school sweetheart? Nave gasped. 
I don't think they actually went to school together, but essentially, Jay was interrupted by Nave, who didn't particularly seem to be listening. I get it, Nave said. I mean, this decision has been coming a long time. Whether to ditch Hagon and decide for me or not. You know what happened? I guess this message just helps her make up her mind. I guess so, Jay said. Thanks for telling me anyway, Jay, Nave said sincerely. I mean, you were probably invading her privacy and such, but it shows you have my back. Hey, the robot said. Firstly, it was a public channel, and I didn't even try to decode the message, and secondly, I've known you longer than I've known her. Twenty minutes, Nave said with a laugh. You've met Altia just twenty minutes after you met me. It's not the length of time that counts. It's the sequence. I can't help it. That's just the architecture of my brain. Anyway, Nave, old pal, didn't you say something about Altia wanting to call a family meeting? Tactical briefing, we used to call them back in the Navy, Nave said. But, Chase said, with just you and me and Altia on the ship, feels much more like a family meeting. I guess that would mean you're his mother, Nave mused. Actually, Jay said, in my head, Altia is the mother, you're the father, Yor is a weird grandparent, and I'm the rebellious teenager. In the end, they chose an observation deck for the meeting, with Altia and Nave seated on the low, comfortable couches. They were an unusual and alien design. They looked industrial, the same bronze, gold, and silver as the rest of the ship, but the feel of the material was sensuous and comfortable. It was seating designed for human backs, but created by a computer intelligence that had never seen a sofa designed by a human before. It was unencumbered by notions such as there should be one chair for one person. It was more of a seating environment, perfect for loose lounging and stargazing. Despite this relaxed feel, they were all three some distance apart, ignoring the fact that the metallic fabric-covered couches looked more like they belonged on a VIP pleasure cruiser than the most capable fighting ship the Rebellion had. Jay didn't bother to sit like his two shipmates, or, more accurately, to sprawl in the case of Nave. Sitting didn't lessen the stresses in the actuators in his knees, hips, or feet particularly, but he didn't see the need. He felt it would be an affectation, an aping of human ways if he did. Instead, he stood by the large hexagonal windows, watching the streaks of the stars hurtling by at faster-than-light speeds. His attention was drawn to the two humans as Altia started speaking. We need to hit them at some sort of hub, some sort of nexus point if we are going to topple the rotten thing that the Terrazid Star Empire has become. We have to tear the whole thing down if we are going to replace it with a new Terrazid. It's not enough to nibble away at the edges, the way we have been doing. We need to land a decisive blow. That sounds like a good idea, Nave said. Have you any suggestions? I started by thinking about the Emperor, Altia said. Obviously, he is a very well-defended target, but he could theoretically be taken out of the picture. Using a spaceship as powerful as this one, and with a good plan. My instinct is that wouldn't work, Nave said, assuming we could even somehow get to him, at the very center of power of the Terrazid Star Empire, and assuming we could take out whatever units they have guarding him. I still don't think it would work. Why not? Jay asked. Say we blasted the president, Nave said, smiling at the thought. Wouldn't they just send whoever is next in line to the throne to rehab? Sober them up and plonk them in the freshly vaporized old emperor's place? Alti almost gasped at the blasphemy of the way Nave was talking. The best she had managed was oblique references to replacing the emperor. She was still amazed at the irreverent language people from impoverished planets, like the one Nave was from, used to talk about the lords and ladies above them in the social order. I suppose you might be right, Nave, she said at last. The difficulty and the easy availability of a replacement may mean taking out the Emperor isn't the kind of decisive knockout blow I want to inflict on them. What about the Admiralty? Nave suggested. It might be a bit harder to just replace an Admiral than it is to replace an Emperor. I disagree, Jay said. I do not think even killing every Admiral in the Admiralty would cause too much of a disruption to the Terrazid Deep Space Navy, and certainly not to the Empire as a whole. In fact, the difficulty in Altius' plan is finding a nexus point important enough that destroying it will be a telling blow to the Empire. The Empire spans a good fraction of the galaxy, yet it is diffuse and dispersed. They are, simply put, too spread out for there to be many really big concentrations of power. 
So should we give up? Nave asked. Should we come up with another strategy? Or continue with what we're doing? No, Altius said, gently but firmly. The strategy is sound. We must simply find the right point and strike. All three of them lapsed into silence, mentally analyzing what they knew of the Empire, looking for weaknesses that could be exploited. Altia called up a few hologram screens of data and started scanning through them. Jay continued to stare out the window, and Nave closed his eyes and lay back against the strange, yielding meadow of the couch. He only realized he had fallen asleep when he jerked awake. He wondered if he had been snoring or drooling, but nobody seemed to have noticed. He breathed a sigh of relief, and suddenly he remembered a flash of what he had been dreaming about. He'd been dreaming about combat with the buzzers, the hybrid organic robotic crab-like creatures that were humanity's only alien foe. Wait, Nave said. There's maybe something. There is? Jay's alien and robotic voice didn't betray any sarcasm, but Nave was pretty sure it was there all the same. The war with buzzers, Nave said. What was all that about again, in the beginning? That depends on whether you believe official history, or if you believe our very own prophetess, Bethshara, Altia said. Bethshara's version, Nave said. I can't remember the details. I'd been drinking when I watched the lecture, but it rang true. The war with the buzzers was, in the beginning at least, about expansion, Jay said. Humanity wanted to expand, and the buzzers were in the way. Well, not the buzzers exactly. The extinct species that created them. But space is three-dimensional, Nave said. If it was really just about expansion, surely humanity could have gone round, or over, or under the buzzers. Why did they have to go through? Didn't Beth Shara say, Jay wondered aloud, as he accessed his memory banks. No, I don't think she did. Call her, Nave said. Where is all this coming from, Jay asked. And how has this got anything to do with finding a weak point in the Empire using it to tear the whole thing down? Don't know, Nave said, but he had a half-snarl, half-smile of triumph on his face now. Sure, he was onto something. Let's humor him, Altia said, indulgently. He has a rare mind. Yort. Call up a map of the frontier with the buzzers, Nave said. Let me take a look at it. A star map appeared, projected from a hologram system hanging above them, embedded among other complex technology in the observation deck ceiling. The hologram was a beautiful thing, projected in metallic shades of bronze gold and some silver. A scattering of star systems appeared, with various lines drawn around and through them to show the shifting border established between buzzer and human space over thousands of titanic space battles, and almost as many planetary assaults, with some systems still changing hands from time to time. The Nexus is here. Somewhere, Nave said, and his eyes were immediately drawn to forward base Apollyon. He stared at it, trying to work out if his gaze being drawn to it was just a hunch, or if there was something deeper going on. Altia had seen him like this before. He had had the same look on his face when he had helped her discover the deeper, hidden levels of the Drifter Complex on the Ice Tomb. It was a hugely important discovery, and had eventually led them to the Drifter ship. What is it, Nave? She asked encouragingly. Go ahead, tell us. This place here, he answered, pointing at forward base Apollyon. Okay, Altia said. Tell me more. There's something about it, Nave said. Something important. It's hard to put into words. He looked round and his gaze fell on Jay, and he looked upwards at the jumbled technology hanging from the ceiling. Help me out. Jay? Yort? He said. Can't you guys do some clever calculations or something? And tell me why this place is significant? Jay walked over to the tactical hologram and stared at it for a while. Then he went back to his spot by the window, looking out at real stars, not just points representing their locations in a hologram. I'm sorry, Nave, Jay said. I just don't see it. Forward base Apollyon doesn't seem to have any more or less significance than any of these other forward bases. No, Nave hissed. It does. I can see it. It does, right, Yord? I agree with Jay, the ship's computer said. This forward base is unlikely to be essential to the continued existence of the Terrazid Star Empire, in its current form. Nave turned to Altia, then, not saying a word, 
but his eyes were pleading with her to back him up. At first, she didn't see it either. But then something, something she hoped was logical rather than just her feelings for Nave, started to see some significance in what he was saying. I see some connections, she said, scrolling through screens of data she had called up from the hologram. A lot of recent developments, such as the faster drives of the Swift destroyers, trace their origins back to this system. Yes, Nave said, that's it. My brother works at a drone manufacturing plant, and he told me that the most advanced and dangerous units are always sent to forward base Apollyon. He called it the dark heart of the Empire. Altia nodded, accessing more information. Take a look, Jay. On the surface, this base is not particularly unusual, a little larger than most, perhaps. But you don't have to do much digging before its significance becomes apparent. I guess, Jay said, not particularly convinced. I think we should turn our attention away from supporting every little rebel band that calls for help, Altia said. That's simply a waste of this ship's potential to change everything. Our strategy now should be to take down forward base Apollyon, as a first step in destroying the Terrazid Star Empire. I don't know, Jay said. I guess if you both agree, especially you, Altia, then maybe it isn't a completely terrible idea. Yes, Navy helped. We have a majority. Let's do this thing. So? What's our first move? Altia asked. There's a long stretch of space between our present location and the Empire's border with the buzzers. And, Jay nodded, the Rebellion is much weaker at the border. Look. He typed some parameters into the hologram projector, using a small holographic keyboard, his spidery fingers a ballet of creepy movement, and the hologram zoomed out to show the entire Terrazid Star Empire. He tapped a few more commands in, and all the systems, with any kind of ongoing rebel activity, were circled in an intense gold that really popped in comparison to the dull bronze shade of the rest of the hologram. There's a ton of gold coreward, Nave said, towards civilized space, and a lot less out on the rim. That's strange. Very, Jay said. Maybe because of the war, Nave said, his voice low as he thought about what he was seeing. And the systems out on the front are a lot more jingoistic and patriotic, because the Navy keeps swooping in and saving their asses from the buzzers. They'd be a lot less patriotic if the Navy stopped turning up on time, Jay mused. A few buzzer massacres would do a lot to help recruitment for the rebellion among these people. That's an appalling idea, Altia yelped, as she got up, moved across to Jay and slapped the back of the robot's head with the flat of her hand making a loud metallic clang that echoed round the observation lounge. Then, she grabbed her stinging hand. Ouch. Jay turned away from the stars he had been staring at to gaze at Altia. Yeah, robot, Nave called over, good-naturedly. If you could cool your kill-all-humans instincts for just one second. We have to come up with an actual plan here. A low, grinding noise came from within Jay, a noise Altia and Nave recognized as a belly laugh. I wasn't actually suggesting staging buzzer massacres or sabotaging the Navy as they protect border systems. Jay chuckled, a background rumble, like a badly malfunctioned refrigerator, indicating how amused he was that he had shocked the two humans so thoroughly. Even if Nave's shock, at least, was more than a little play acting. I was just pointing out a fact. It's something to bear in mind. Okay, Altia said, leaning up against his strangely warm robot body so she could reach the little holographic keyboard he was using. She typed in some parameters, and the hologram shifted again. It now showed the stretch of space between their present location and forward base Apollyon. There is a stop we should make on the way, she said. Oh yeah, Brig, Nave nodded. We should visit our base. It's been a while. Yes, but not just that, Altia said. She poked her finger into the hologram and started drawing a line. The line moved from a point that indicated their current location, then the finger moved to Brig, the side of the planetary base they had established. Then, before continuing to the border, it stopped at an insignificant-looking main sequence star. Hang on, Nave said. That's... Vain Tempest, Altia said, completing his sentence for him as his words trailed off. My home planet, Nave whispered. There was a pause as everyone stared at the track Altia had drawn in the hologram. It's a border system, Jay said. Not really, Nave said. It looks close to the border on the map, 
but we were never bothered much by buzzer attacks, not like some of the other systems nearer the border. Some of them see some heavy fighting from time to time. It's just a short hop to forward base Apollyon, Altia nodded, agreeing with Jay. Doesn't mean a thing, Nave said. Trust me, the place is a shithole. If you look up the definition of shithole in the computer databanks, a picture of Vane Tempest will appear. I mean it. We seriously do not need to go there. That's where the drone manufacturing plant you mentioned is located, Altia said, as she returned to her couch to her hologram screens. The plant where your brother works. It looks to me like he might have a lot of valuable insight about how to destroy such a huge and well-defended target. We can decide after we drop by Brig, Jay said. We can ask the Roundhead about it. And I'm sure it can't be that bad, Altia smiled, as Nave glowered. She typed a few more commands into a little glowing input keyboard of her own, and the stars disappeared from the main hologram map, replaced by a slowly spinning orb. The words Vane Tempest appeared underneath it, and a text window appeared beside it. Altia's eyes quickly glanced through the text. She leaned forward and reaching into the hologram to scroll left and right with swipes of her finger within the text field. Ugh, she grunted. Who designed that atmosphere? Told you, Nave said. It's the armpit of the galaxy. Now, let's lay on a course for Brig. It would be interesting, you're right, to hear what Roundhead has to say about forward base Apollyon. If anyone knows how it can be destroyed, it's her. My brother and my home planet are nothing but a distraction. Chapter 5 There was only one settlement on Brig and from just one glance it was obvious that it was created by the same technology that had produced the drifter ship. Everywhere there was dull sheen of bronze and hexagonal clusters of technology, so characteristic of drifter architecture and systems. It was perched at the edge of a cliff, overlooking a wide canyon and a desert plain spread away on the other side. The settlement was big, like a town or a university campus. It was surrounded by a high wall, and it was blasted by a yellow sun, powerful despite the cloud cover. Sand drifted among the spaces between the buildings, carried over the wall by the wind. There was a large landing pad near the settlement, outside the walls, and a number of orbital shuttles were squatting there during their short rests for reloading and refueling, before once more returning to ferrying people and supplies between the planet and the rebel fleet that orbited the planet. One of the larger buildings of the settlement had come to be called the Dome of the Shard, and within it, Deep at the building's core, two women were talking. The progress we've made is mind-boggling, one of the women said, the one named Xenia. She was the younger of the two, her long blonde hair fashionably cut, her clothes expensive and tasteful. She also openly wore a pistol and a holster at her hip. The other woman was a little older, and she had a very different look. She was dressed in robes, and she wore a strange smooth hat like an upturned bowl made of smoky glass. Near her eyes, behind the semi-transparent surface of the helmet, luminous symbols were dancing. This woman was the one named Bathshara, though most simply called her Roundhead. Our progress has, as you say, been phenomenal, the older woman replied, glancing up from her work. And it wouldn't have been possible without you, Xenia. The progress you made while I was incarcerated is impressive. Thank you, Xenia said, genuinely touched by the compliment. The room had no windows, and it wasn't brightly illuminated. Most of the light was coming from the machine that dominated the center of the space. There were thick data cables, huge data storage cores, and data transfer breakers, all striving to tame the flood of information surging through the system. The source of all this information was the central part of the machine, the shard. It was a simple lump of crystal. Or at least, that's what it looked like. But both women knew it was much more than it appeared. The more information they managed to retrieve, the more throughput they pushed the machine to handle, the more information the shard provided, and the brighter it shone. The big question is, Roundhead said, if this information is exhaustible, will we ever get a message saying that all the data has been transferred? Is that even possible? It can't be infinite, Xenia said. Nothing is. That's not the question I was asking. There is a more intriguing possibility. Perhaps. 
Roundhead glanced at Xenia and smiled. Perhaps some of this information is being generated. Generated? Certainly, Roundhead nodded. How can all these details have ever been written to the Shard? Even by a culture as advanced as ancient Terrazid. It might just be generating some of it. In the same way, the human mind generates information to make the memories it stores seem more real? Perhaps, Roundhead said, with a smile. Or perhaps, it is evidence of some other function. Perhaps the shard is more than just a data storage device. That's intriguing to be sure, Xenia said. But it isn't the big question. It isn't? Bishara was genuinely surprised. What she had just said was momentous in its implications. How could it not be the big question? No, Xenia continued. The big question is, what we are going to do with all this data? What do you mean? Roundhead was a little confused, though she thought she now had some idea what Xenia was alluding to. You know what I mean, Xenia said, accusingly. I'm talking about what you already started doing with this information when you were broadcasting from prison. I'm talking about curating it. That was a necessary expedient, Roundhead said. I needed to put out a few enticing tidbits. I needed to attract followers to get myself rescued. For the Shard to be liberated. To be reunited with the Shard. Exactly, Xenia nodded, smiling, pleased with how well Roundhead had explained the power of ideas to make things happen. We need to continue releasing information in order to help the Rebellion achieve its aims, to shape it, to give it focus. Roundhead stared at her for a few moments, seeing the allure of what she was proposing, but instinctively wary. I thought we could simply release all the information, Roundhead said, walking over to the center of the tango of machinery they had built, and actually patting the surface of the shard. We just free the information contained in here, make it searchable, make the shard a tool for people to use and understand, rather than some abstract focus of worship. Yes, of course, Xenia nodded enthusiastically. And we'll continue on with that mission. But what has it achieved so far? What do you mean? Roundhead asked, a little defensively at the slight derision she detected in Xenia's voice. Nothing, Xenia said, ignoring the question and simply carrying on with the point she was trying to make. It's too much for ordinary people. Too complex. Too difficult to interpret. We have to do more than reveal the true history of Terraza to them. We have to show them which periods are most important what were our brightest moments, and convince them to try and emulate those times of old, when the Terrazid Star Empire was great. And when exactly was that? Roundhead asked. But before Xenia could answer, there was a chime from a communications console. It was a communication from the fleet in orbit. Roundhead accepted the call, and a hologram of a young officer appeared. The drifter ship has returned, the young officer told them. Altia heard footsteps and knew it was Nave. There were only two others on the giant spaceship with her, Nave and Jay, and the difference in the sound between their footsteps was quite pronounced. Jay made a sound like a tapping and scratching as his spidery metal feet made contact with the metal of the deck. Nave, on the other hand, made a more muffled noise, but heavier and more solid. Hey, Altia, she heard his voice. You in there? Down here, she called, hearing the pleasure in her own voice. Usually she didn't like interruptions, but she liked it when Nave was round, even when, as usual, he was disturbing important work. He had found her in an area of the ship that they thought of as the spine. It was the main load-bearing structure of the vessel, and ran in a delicate arch from the nose, just under the dorsal armor, all the way to the engines at the rear. It was a space above the uppermost deck that gave access to a huge portion of the elegant structure, and Altia was starting to realize that it held enormous significance for the ship. She was about halfway along the spine, in an area that was like a low room, unusually low for the architecture of the drifter ship, like an attic. The room was full of equipment, including hologram projectors, tools, data pads, calculating cores, and scores of other devices. It was the paraphernalia of a scientist at her studies, though Nave couldn't immediately see what exactly it was she was studying. And there was a section of the floor that she had excavated alongside the spine. He could see that. From this excavated area, the spine was exposed, 
just below the thick armor of the hull above their head, and most of her equipment was spread out at the rim, within easy reach. Nave could see her within the excavated area, so he poked his head over the rim of her pit and he beamed at her. He lowered himself down and leaned in for a kiss. At the same time, she reached up, put one hand on either side of his face, and pressed her lips against his. She pulled away before the kiss became too deep, before she got distracted from her studies of the alien spaceship. We'll be arriving at Brig in a few hours, Nave told her. If you want to squeeze in a few hours rest before we get there, now's the time. She nodded, then looked over her shoulder at her work. There are a few things I need to finish up, she said, but I'll be done in a second. Nave grinned at her, making her forehead wrinkle in confusion. No problem, he said. He was smiling because this was one of her habits, and he was getting wise to it. If he took her at her word and left, he would be in for a long wait. She could never tear herself away from what she was doing. He knew a lot of people would find it frustrating, having to wait to receive the undivided attention of the person they loved, but not him. He was endlessly patient, happy with his life the way it was now, especially his new, more intimate relationship with Altia, and he was content to let things unfold without forcing the pace. What are you grinning about? she asked. Nothing, Nave told her, and he slumped down on the room's sofa. I just like to watch you work. Take your time. I'll sit here. You can tell me what you're doing if you like. I enjoy hearing about it, as long as you don't use too many big words. All right, Altia agreed, with a smile, then turned back to her work. It's a dream come true for a researcher like me. I'm learning so much about so many things. I'm surrounded by data. She waved an arm around her head in a gesture that looked a little like she was swatting mosquitoes. But Nave knew she was indicating the data stream they could access with their minds and which seemed to hang about them like a cloud. And I have the most advanced drifter systems at my fingertips. And the systems are alive. The fact that it's alive makes it better than the entire artificial planet composed of drifter technology that I was studying. Before the breakthrough that brought me to Ice Tomb, where we met, Nave interrupted in a whisper. Where we met, she glanced over her shoulder and smiled. But it was all dead, inert, like a bleached coral reef. This is all gloriously alive. So you're having fun, Nave said. So much, I just can't describe it. Look here. She pointed at a complex structure, a honeycomb of hexagons that she was examining just at that moment. It's a system that routes power, but the way it's expressed from the substrate of the ship is... I said no big words, Nave called from where he was comfortably sprawled on the sofa. Okay, think of it like this. The spaceship is made of stuff, right? Altia said, shooting him a smile over her shoulder. Okay, Nave said, that's dumbed down enough for me. You can carry on. The stuff is the substrate, Altia said, and the process the ship uses to make the things we need... Our clothes, the sofa you're sitting on, guns, armor, drones, is a process called expression. It's a mixture of manufacturing, programming, and growth. And the results are so elegant. Just look at this heat sink. Altia pointed to a stalactite of material hanging from a clump of hexagonal components. It's a thing of beauty, she said. And you can interact with this ship in so many ways. Through the data stream, you can talk to Yort. You can inscribe symbols directly into the walls. The substrate understands the symbols. It's like the spaceship is built from solid information. That sounds a bit weird, Nave mused. Trust me, Altia told him. The more you investigate it, the weirder it gets. I trust you, Nave told her, his voice strangely earnest. Something in his voice caught her attention, touching a deep chord within her. I can stop this here, she said. I'll let my computing cores do some rendering and ruminating without me here to distract them with new questions. Altia reached out to her main hologram console and switched it off. She watched screen after screen fade away, then she rubbed her eyes, climbed out of the pit she had excavated, and followed Nave. Later, sleeping in the nook between Nave's chest and his bicep, Altia dreamed about alien structures, vertiginous bronze towers rising from a dark sea. She was swimming there 
swimming in the dark shadows of the towers, her limbs warmed by the inky waters of the sea. She stopped swimming and lay on her back, but even though she wasn't swimming anymore, she was held on the surface by the buoyancy of the water. She relaxed and stared up into the sky. The towers were tall, she saw. So tall, they reminded her of the vertical ribbons of space elevators. They didn't look stable at all, like they would wave around and snap if there was the slightest wind. But there was no wind. The sky was dark. The tops of the towers were lost in the gloom above. Altia suddenly realized there was no open sky. There was only the interior surface of some giant structure, covering the sea like a blanket or a crust. It was far above, too far to see, but somehow she knew it was there. The crust prevented any light from penetrating from above. There was no sun or moon, and there were no stars. What is this place? Altia whispered as she floated there. She took a breath, turned over, and dived below the surface. She saw that the bronze columns extended just as far below the water as they towered above it. Each tower went down and down, before being lost in the gloom of the murky water. She came back to the surface and let out a breath she had been holding in with a gasp. She swam to the nearest of the towers, which took some period of time that was very difficult to determine. She couldn't decide if she had been swimming for just a few seconds, or if it had actually been hours, or maybe even days. The tower grew and grew, the way a mountain does as you slowly approach it. The tower that had seemed quite smooth from a distance was actually covered in devices, systems and writings. Parts of the tower projected like piers and balconies, while other parts were recessed like caves, 